And this is part of the um, a five year grant that we have with Montgomery County's Office of Drug and Alcohol Programs. Uh, it's called the Youth Marijuana, Marijuana Prevention Project. We've just completed our first of five years and um, really grateful to the Montgomery County Office of Drug and Alcohol. We've partnered with them for many years to bring lots of programs like this to you. Uh, so thank you to them. And I'm very excited to introduce you to our speaker today. I want to just, and in full disclosure for myself, um, I just want to say that, um, you know, I have a son who's in recovery um, and he was a patient at Karen Treatment Center 10 years ago. And I'm really happy to say that he has remained sober ever since, uh, which is very fortunate for all of us. Um, I was very uh, grateful to Karen for learning all that we did as a family. Um, and also in full disclosure, I am on the advisory board, regional advisory board of Karen Treatment Center. So, um, and you'll understand why I'm talking about Karen so much right now, but we, because we we're fortunate to have Dr. Garbley with us. Um, uh, he, as executive vice president of medical services and chief medical officer at Karen Treatment Centers, Dr. Garbley oversees the following programs and departments, healthcare professionals program, chronic pain program, neurocognitive services Pro department, psychology, research, detoxification, and medical management. And as we were just chatting, also uh, COVID-19, it seems. So lots to deal with up there, at Karen. Uh, Dr. Garbley has spearheaded a high-level initiative to educate and train physicians in addiction medicine through the establishment of the resident training program at Karen, Pennsylvania. Uh, he established an accredi accreditation council for accredited addiction medicine fellowship program at Karen, Pennsylvania, and at Reading Hospital. And as the Addiction Medicine Fellowship Director, Dr. Garbley is a member of the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine. He is also a Clinical Associate Professor at Penn State College of Medicine, an Adjunct Associate Professor at Stony Brook School of Medicine, and a member of the medical staff at Reading Hospital. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can all say hello to Dr. Garbley. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kim, very much for uh, that wonderful introduction and congratulations to your son. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to so share your gonna, screen and, and get us started. So we're going to get that done. So thank you everyone for uh, being here this morning. I know it's an early hour. Uh, I wore uh, a tie that will hopefully wake everyone up if you take a look at it. It's certainly helping me stay awake. I had a uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine ASAM Board of Trustees meeting that ran into the wee hours of the morning last night. Um, so uh, I figured I'd wear my wake up tie so that I stay awake and everyone else does as well. So I'll be talking about um, some of the uh, same things that uh, Dr. Jensen and Dr. Marsh talked about, but I'm really going to concentrate on the unique nature of uh, cannabis use disorder and how it works in the brain and the psychiatric and medical comorbidities that we have seen with uh, cannabis use disorder. So I have no relevant or even irrelevant uh, financial relationships or commercial interests that are um, in conflict of interest. Our learning objectives today will be uh, first and foremost to understand that the medicalization and legalization of recreational marijuana has correlated to a significant uptick in this uh, diagnosis of cannabis use disorder and the current medical and psychiatric comorbid comorbidities that come with this use disorder. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper than the uh, other speakers around uh, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol and its effects in the brain. That is the active ingredient in marijuana, the psychoactive ingredient. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to describe and identify uh, the criterion for uh, cannabis use disorder and when it's uh, important to refer to treatment. So for a long time now, uh, we've really uh, kind of crossed our fingers and hoped that marijuana would be the answer to a lot of our I issues. Uh, when it comes to some of the more difficult medical problems that we have uh, in front of us to treat. Uh, 
Chronic pain is one of them. We want to try to avoid using opioids if we can. And cannabis has been something that has been touted as a possible solution to that. Um, I know that there was a lot of talk about medical marijuana, and I'll get to that in just a second. But um, this is uh, a picture of all the different types of uh, marijuana that's available at dispensaries. So if you do get a marijuana card from a physician, you end up at a dispensary. And these are the prescriptions that you w would get if you want to call them that. And, the, and there is... Uh, some guidance as to how often you should take it and what is the best form of this, of this plant for what ails you. So it is um, not uh, the same science that we're used to. We're used to the Federal Drug Administration approving medications. They tell us the, the way the me medication works, the efficacy of the medication, the side effects, how much to give and how often to give. And that's not true yet with uh, cannabis. So there's many forms of cannabis. The smokable forms are typically not the ones that are used in medical marijuana. Most states that have approved medical marijuana went through uh, the edible route. Um, and there's issues with that in the sense that um, if you ingest cannabis through uh, a gummy bear or a brownie or uh, an infused liquid, it's going to take longer to get any kind of effect. And if you're used to smoking cannabis, the effect is almost immediate, and that delay with edibles can lead to over-ingestion of cannabis because of the impatience of trying to get the, the feeling you're looking for. So I know that you've seen this slide in one form or another uh, from the other two talks, uh, Dr. Jensen uh, had a slide like that, and Dr. Marsh as well. But I just wanted to highlight um, first and foremost the last uh, the last bullet point here, which is the illegal states, because they are in, definitely in the minority. And you can see that there are only three states where marijuana remains illegal for recreational purposes, and there is no medicinal marijuana. Most states, uh, you can see in the lighter green there, have passed medical marijuana laws, typically using edibles. Many states have decriminalized uh, marijuana. And then some states have uh, legalized recreational marijuana and uh, medical marijuana. You can see on the West Coast, uh, all the states there um, have uh, legalized uh, the ability to uh, cultivate uh, and use marijuana in recreational form and also in medicinal forms. And Colorado is in the middle of the state, but that was one of the first. And we're going to talk a little bit more about lessons learned from Colorado. So this is uh, an epidemiological study. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, your fill of them with the last two presentations, but it's really important to understand these studies, because this is how we understand whether substances are on the rise or they've flattened out or they're decreasing. So this is the 2018 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And in this survey, you can see that there is an uptick in uh, initiating the use of marijuana for people that are 12 or older. And it breaks it down into different age groups. The red line is everybody. So you can see that there is a gradual uptick. And in the last two years, that uptick is steeper than uh, the previous years. And you can also see that in the 26 and older, there is a significant uptick um, in the 12 to 17 and the, uh, in that 12 to 17 group, it's pretty much flat. And that's what Dr. Jensen was talking about as, uh, as far as studies go, epidemiologic studies, that is. It's really stayed sort of constant in the adolescent population, but the young adults and the uh, older, uh, 26 and older adults, there's been a, a significant uptick, and that is why that red line goes up like it does in the last two years. So this bears uh, talking about, you can see here that somewhere around 2015, the use of uh, daily marijuana surpassed uh, daily cigarette use. 
So we've seen a steady decline uh, when it comes to cigarette use, but we've seen an incline in uh, daily marijuana use. And that 2.4% that circled is vaping. I, I know that uh, both Dr. Marsh and Dr. Jensen talked about vaping and the, and the vicissitudes that can be suffered when someone is vaping, lung injury, and, and things of that sort. Dr. Jensen spent quite a bit of time talking about some of the uh, medical issues associated with vaping, um, so I won't get too deep into that. But you can see that alcohol, which is the bottom line, has really kind of uh, stayed steady uh, throughout uh, the years, um, but marijuana has started to tick up in a way that should be concerning to all of us. So marijuana use among youth. So young people use more potent marijuana. We know that. And uh, you can uh, vape marijuana at very high concentrations of the psychoactive substance. That's delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol. THC is commonly how it is understood. So you can have up to 99% THC in some uh, vaping delivery systems. Also, dabbing can do that as well. Um, I'll talk to you about the fact that uh, most marijuana now is about 20%. Um, Delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient, um, but there are uh, preparations uh, and ways to get much higher concentrations, and that's what I'm talking about in that first uh, bullet point. So the 2019 Monitoring the Future study, this is looking at uh, young people, 8th grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade uh, students, and what you see that near daily use of marijuana has gone up from uh, it's, it's increased 26.3% uh, between 2018 and 2019. So that's, that's significant because that near daily use is where many of the psychiatric, behavioral, and even medical problems come from. And uh, young people are reporting vaping marijuana in increasingly large numbers uh, since such data was recorded in 2017. And that was uh, talked about by Dr. Jensen, so I won't get too deeply into that. So vaping is up, vaping marijuana is up, and uh, also uh, near daily use of marijuana is up. And again, I wanna just, uh, uh, just harken back to Dr. Jensen's talk where he said uh, that you know, overall we've not seen a huge uptick, but we, the one caveat to that is the near daily marijuana use uh, has has been uh, increasing over time. And this is uh, showing more about vaping. So I, again, you've heard uh, quite a bit about that, but you could see that that's up significantly uh, in uh, 10th grader, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. Um, and you see in the blue there, or the, I guess it's the violet, uh, in 2019, the numbers have really uh, gone up quite steadily. Uh, and that is uh, past month uh, vaping of marijuana use. So why is this happening? Well, there's a normalization that's occurring, and that normalization really comes from the fact that we have looked at marijuana as a medicinal plant, and we have uh, attributed many different maladies uh, to its use. Uh, the studies uh, around medical marijuana, however, are really only showing that certain seizure disorders, chronic neuropathic pain, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, uh, intractable nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, and also wasting syndrome in uh, AIDS, uh, which is advanced HIV. These are the studies that have uh, the best track record of showing some medicinal quality to the plant for those maladies. We need more studies to find out whether the plant can help in other uh, ways and whether parts of the plant that maybe are not addictive, like CBD, uh, might be a better alternative. So we're in the very early stages, in the nascent stages, really, of studying marijuana and its uses in different uh, medical maladies. So there's a lot of media coverage to talk about marijuana. Um, uh, Sanjay Gupta, I know Dr. Marsh talked about Sanjay and, and he was talking about the use of marijuana in intractable seizures. And that uh, platform that um, uh, Dr. Gupta has 
really kind of helped normalize and medicalize, if you will, um, marijuana. And medical uh, uses is uh, marketed as healthy or natural, but as I mentioned before, when you go to a dispensary, it's, uh, it's really not an exact science. So the Federal Drug Administration is not part of it. We don't have the studies really to guide us and to make really cogent decisions with our patients. We can't get informed consent because we do not have the data in front of us like we do with every other medication that's gone through the FDA. So we can't talk about how it works, how much that someone should need, uh, how often they should take it, and what are the side effects. And that's something that uh, physicians do as a matter of course with every initiation of any medication. We're ob obliged to do that. We need to talk to our patients about the medication we're prescribing and let them know if they have these side effects, that's probably from the medicine and they should call us. And this is why we're prescribing it because here's the studies that show that its efficacy for that particular malady is such that we want to prescribe that particular medicine. So there's expansion and ease of delivery, edibles I mentioned, vaping has been mentioned multiple times, decriminalization advocacy, which you saw has been happening across the country, and then COVID-19, which has hit us uh, very hard uh, as a country since uh, mid-March, and uh, folks are uh, furloughed or they're not in school um, and they have a lot of anxiety and quarantine fatigue and the marijuana uh, is a way for them to maybe treat some of the anxiety uh, about the future. This study is a very important study and what it shows is uh, perceived risk of different uh, substances. And you can see that the perceived risk of cocaine, heroin, uh, even alcohol and cigarettes is pretty high and has remained high over the past few years. But smoking marijuana once or twice a week was the question, and that perceived risk has gone considerably down over time. And there is an inverse proportion that occurs when you perceive a low risk of a substance, you increase the use of that particular substance. So if someone thinks that uh, marijuana is safe, healthy, medicinal, then they're going to smoke it. It's just that simple. If they feel like it can cause problems such as cocaine, heroin, they may avoid that. And we see that uh, so often here. There is an incredible uptick in uh, cannabis use disorder as the solo diagnosis here at Karen, and I'll show you those stats coming up in the future. So let's talk about legal versus non-legal. So in 2019, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, state comparison showed the following. And uh, the way they broke it down is past year use versus past month use of marijuana. And they looked at different age groups. So this is the adolescent age group, 12 to 17 year olds in legal states. There was an increase in three by 3.5%. Uh, from 2016-17 to 2017-18. So as uh, it got easier to get marijuana, more adolescents were experimenting with it and starting to use it uh, in, in an experimental way, which may morph into a much more egregious way. And then uh, again, past year and past month, uh, marijuana use amongst the young adults has increased even greater at 4.4% in that same time period. And there was actually one study that uh, found cases of cannabis use disorder in young people in legal states grew 25% following legalization. So what we need is more studies. I agree with Dr. Jensen that we need more studies to really make a definitive statement about what is happening out there. But it, there is no doubt a trend happening in states that have legalized recreational marijuana. There's an increase in adolescent use and an increase in uh, young adult use. So what have we learned from Colorado? I think it's important that we learn from different states that have gone before us and then make decisions based upon that. So in Colorado, 65% increase in first time marijuana use among youth. This is number one in the nation. So after they pass the medical uh, medicalization of marijuana and then the uh, made uh, recreational use legal, you saw a steady increase in Colorado is now uh, number one in the nation in first time users of marijuana. 
And also in that same state, marijuana involved adolescent suicides are up, uh, marijuana involved DUIs are up, fatal motor vehicle accidents are up as well that are uh, attributed to marijuana. ER visits oftentimes because of the edibles, young people will eat their uh, the, the um, gummy bears that mommy, mom and dad have for medicinal reasons, or uh, young people will get edibles and then they will be looking for that quick feeling that they're used to getting when they smoke marijuana, and then they just continue to over ingest and then they inadvertently overdose. There's the Dawn study that shows that very well. That Dawn study was done by the NIH, and it looked at ER visits associated with uh, all substances, and there was quite an uptick in uh, marijuana-related ER visits. And then incidents of psychosis at all ages, and I'm going to talk to you about vulnerabilities. We've actually identified a gene, a specific gene, that increases vulnerability for psychosis. And I, I want to make a statement here that we see substance, uh, marijuana-induced psychosis at a much higher rate than we ever did. I would say that every week we have at least one admission of a young person, whether it's adolescent or young adult, who's coming in smoking marijuana on a near daily basis or daily basis that ends up with a uh, true psychotic disorder, but it's induced by the, by the substance. It's not uh, an underlying psychotic disorder. It is simply because of the effects of marijuana on that vulnerable brain. And Dr. Jensen mentioned that in uh, his talk as well. And uh, he mentioned that after 72 hours of abstinence, you start to see clearing. And we see that as well. We add medications and we also, uh, you know, watch and wait. And over about three to five days, uh, uh, that psychosis clears up on its own. There's an increase in crime in Colorado associated with marijuana, and then a difficulty hiring workers because of the uh, pre-employment uh, toxicology that is gotten. Uh, marijuana is part of the uh, five substances that is looked at for pre-employment, and as a result, of uh, legalizing recreational marijuana, there's been a difficulty in hiring workers in Colorado, and they've had to import workers from other states. So why, t why are teens trying marijuana, um, and uh, also why are young adults trying marijuana? So in high school, uh, there's a lot of parental pressure to do well, to get into a good college. That may be a reason to try to use marijuana to help with the anxiety around that. Pressures about college, again, anxiety, trying to help with that. Um, social media has normalized this, as I mentioned before, the use of marijuana, so that more and more young people are trying it. Uh, peer pressure, rebellion, stress environment and in high levels of anxiety and depression. And I want to say that in the beginning, it may be that the use of marijuana helps anxiety or helps depression, but as you use it more and more often and get to a point of near daily or daily, there's the law of diminishing returns. That which you're trying to help, like anxiety or depression, actually gets worse over time the more you use it. And in college, it's freedom. Uh, freedom uh, basically from parental controls, and they have a chance to experiment. Uh, the structure is often not very well defined, and if you're over 18, you, uh, your parents don't have legal authority. Uh, it's also a new environment, culture, academic stressors, access to, uh, to the substance itself. And then high levels of anxiety and depression go with pressures in college. So again, you might use it uh, in the beginning uh, infrequently with some benefit, but as you use it more and more, the law of diminishing returns kicks in. So I won't get into the difference between uh, cannab cannabinoids and uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. I'm going to focus only on THC. Um, I know Dr. Marsh covered uh, the difference between the two and uh, the medical marijuana uh, issues associated with both CBD and THC. 
So again, I mentioned before in, 19, in the 1980s, the THC concentration was 4%, and now in 2018, the average THC concentration has gone up five times to 20%. And again, THC is the psychoactive component of marijuana. And research shows that 9% of all users become addicted. So that's everyone who um, uses marijuana on an increased frequency over time, 9% will, be, will end up having a true cannabis use disorder. Now, if you start early, um, and Dr. Jensen mentioned at age 14, well, there's studies looking at that. So if you start um, before the age of 15, so at the age of 14, the, the rate of addiction goes up to 17%. And if you use it every day, that number is 20 to 25% become addicted and have a fully codified cannabis use disorder. And using marijuana as a medication-assisted uh, treatment strategy implies daily use. I put that in there because there are some people that think that that would be the best way to go when it comes to MAT. And I've given many talks why that doesn't work. Actually, what happens is... Um, Opioids are used more frequently, and so is marijuana. So there, it doesn't replace the opioids like medication-assisted uh, treatment does. So this is just the definition of addiction. It's worth mentioning. It's a stress-induced, genetically mediated, primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So, and dysfunction of these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. And this is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief. And I want to circle that if, for you because a lot of people have that anxiety and they use it for relief, but then it morphs into something else over time as you use more and more. Um, so it's a uh, addiction is a chronic disease, and um, there's uh, chronic diseases that, is, that are on the right side of your screen, and no one uh, here, I believe, would argue that they are diseases, but many people do argue still that addiction is not a chronic disease, and it is indeed a chronic disease, because addiction is treated. It's not cured. It's characterized by relapse and remission, like many of the diseases on the right. Outcomes depend on continuity of care over time, just like the diseases that you see on the right of your screen. And genetic plus environmental factors determine vulnerability, exactly the same as the diseases on the right side of your screen. And this is just a, a, a slide that synthesizes the vulnerability of addiction. So uh, genetics represents about 50% uh, of the vulnerability. And then if you throw environment in there, such as uh, adverse childhood experiences, if you have four or more of those experiences as a child, we know that you have a seven times greater risk of going on to have an addiction, depending on your drug of choice. What drug you choose actually makes a difference whether you'll be addicted or not. There are some substances that are more addictive than others. Marijuana is actually on the lower end of the addiction scale. Cocaine, methamphetamine are on the higher end of the addiction scale. When you use, the earlier you use, we talked that, about that already, increases your vulnerability. And then brain mechanisms change, and I'll talk about that, and that's how uh, addiction manifests itself. So the two areas of the brain I want to concentrate on when I talk about the disease of addiction are the uh, limbic area of the brain and the prefrontal cortex area of the brain. The limbic area of the brain is where the reward center is. It's from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. That's a dopamine-rich dopamine pathway. It's the reward center. It's very reinforcing. And over time, as you use substances on a daily basis, or near daily basis, that's the only area of the brain that lights up. What happens is the prefrontal cortex, which is where higher executive functioning occurs, it's uh, meta-analysis, thinking about thinking, meta-reality, so it's higher reasoning, higher executive functioning, and, and there's a list of nine things that the prefrontal cortex is responsible for. But understand that it's very much uh, responsible for uh, inhibiting impulses and also uh, attributing uh, importance to any stimulus. And when someone is active in their addiction, that prefrontal cortex is hypoactive. We've, we've done many studies here looking at that, and we see a decrease in activity in the prefrontal cortex. 
And we're able to predict relapse through neuro neuroimaging techniques just looking at the prefrontal cortex. So late into treatment, if someone's prefrontal cortex comes back online and gets active again, their chances of relapse are less than someone who leaves here with their prefrontal cortex still hypoactive. So uh, let me just uh, go through this one more time. It bears repeating. So the, uh, the, the reward center is from the ventral tegmental area to the uh, ventral striatum, which is also known as the nucleus accumbens. The, this is a dopamine-rich area. It's the brain reward center. It's where all drugs of abuse end up, some directly like cocaine and methamphetamine, some indirectly like uh, THC, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a second. And then uh, that's the motivation pathway, and, and that's the one pathway that continues to light up and re be reinforced with drugs of abuse. And the choice mechanism is in the prefrontal cortex. That's where you inhibit impulses and you give importance to stimuli. And that area of the brain I call the brakes and steering, and it is uh, significantly impaired uh, during the commission of active addiction. And uh, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Volkov, Dr. Volkov is the uh, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and somebody that uh, I call a mentor and friend and somebody I work with and do studies with. Um, she came up with uh, Dr. Goldstein with the model that we use in addiction medicine, which is called the ERISA model. And essentially what that is, is it's impairment of response inhibition and salience attribution. So those two, air, that, those two functions I keep talking about in the prefrontal cortex, they are abnormal. And different areas of the prefrontal cortex are responsible for different things. So inhibiting a response is uh, part and parcel to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Salient attribution, assigning importance for any stimulus is in the orbitofrontal prefrontal cortex. And we've been able to measure hypoactivity in both areas during the commission of active addiction. And we've been able to use that data to predict relapse up to 85% in opioid use disorder and also alcohol use disorder. So uh, we also have uh, another study that's going on uh, that's looking at it from a different angle using EEG, standard EEG, to, do, to measure the same area of the brain, and the results are very similar to our initial studies using functional near-infrared spectroscopy. So again, um, the earlier you use, the greater the risk of addiction. So we used to think that the brain was fully mature at the age of 16. Well, we now know that it takes until the mid-20s for the brain to be fully mature. Uh, for women, on average, their brain is mature around the age of 23. For men, most women would say never, but actually we do finally get there around the age of 25. So we do lag behind you, as you, I'm sure, are well aware. Um, but again, it's important to understand that the, that area, that key area, that prefrontal cortex, higher executive functioning area, is not fully mature until the mid-20s. So let me talk to you about the unique way Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol works in the brain and causes addiction. So uh, a brain chemical called anandamide is, uh, is inherent in our brains. We make this chemical, it attaches to uh, certain receptors. Now you can look to the right and that's delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It looks a whole lot like anandamide, right? And that's exactly how it works. So it actually mimics anandamide and binds to the same receptors. And the receptors are CB1, and CB2. CB1 receptors are all throughout uh, the brain, and CB2 receptors are in macrophages, and we're not 100% sure exactly what that does. Uh, we have some theories, but again, I'll just uh, wait till further studies are done, but we'll concentrate on CB1. And this is where the CB1 receptors are, and you can see that um, if Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol binds to these receptors, you can, appetite's affected, learning, memory, and stress is affected, peripheral sensation, including neuropathic pain. That's how it works for neuropathic pain in the spinal cord. Um, nausea, vomiting in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, that's how it works for intractable vomiting and nausea in chemotherapy. Uh, movement in the basal ganglia and also in the cerebellum, 
uh, is effect, it affects movement, it affects depth perception as well, and then of course higher cognitive functioning is affected in the cerebral cortex. This is the structure, so this is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the psychoactive uh, substance I keep mentioning, and uh, it binds to the CB1 receptor and many uh, things happen. There's second messenger systems that are uh, triggered and then there is, uh, you know, a cascade of events that occurs. I won't get into that. We don't have enough time to go through all of that. But what, what essentially happens is that an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, that interneuron is inhibitory. So when THC binds to CB1 receptors on that partic particular GABA interneuron, it inhibits the inhibitory nature of that interneuron and allows for firing of dopamine uh, neurons and an increase in dop dopamine and then it hits the reward center as you can see there in the nucleus accumbens. So it has a bit of a circuitous route, so it's not a direct route, but I, I thought it was very important that you know how it gets reinforced and rewards the person who is taking it. And this is just uh, looking at all the different systems that are involved in the chronic disease, chronic brain disease, that is addiction, and how they interrelate. I'll just uh, mention the amygdala. That's where euphoric recall is stored, and that's where cravings uh, come from. So if, you, if someone is in recovery and they see someone smoking marijuana and that's their drug of choice, the amygdala will light up and they'll have cravings because of that. And this is just looking at what is cannabis intoxication. Um, this is uh, a definition of it. Uh, behavioral psychological changes happen with use and you can see that there's impaired motor coordination and, and I explain why that occurs. Euphoria happens because of its effect in the uh, reward center. Anxiety, if you use it over time on a more frequent basis, in the beginning it may be anxiolytic. Um, in, uh, as you use it more and more, it becomes anxiogenic, meaning it creates anxiety. There's a, a sensation of slow time, impaired judgment, social withdrawal. There's a depth perception problem. So you can see this is not a good drug for driving. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. At least two of the physical signs developing within two hours, um, which include con conjunctival injection, increased appetite, dry mouth, tachycardia, and then possible perceptual changes. And there are vulnerabilities and, and genes that make someone vulnerable for uh, psych psychotic transformation because of marijuana use. All right. And then... Um, and then cannabis withdrawal, there is such a thing. I won't go through all of that. It is um, not something that we have to intervene um, from a withdrawal management point of view. Uh, there, there are issues around sleep and irritability, some anger and aggression, but we're able to deal with that from a, a, a psychological point of view rather than from a, um, from a psycho uh, pharmacological point of view. There's not really a need to start medications. This is a short-lived short -lived withdrawal. And then there's some physical symptoms that occur with withdrawal as well. And then uh, these are the 11 um, criteria in the DSM-5 that uh, identify whether uh, someone has a substance use disorder, in this case marijuana use disorder, um, if you have only one of these, you do not have a use disorder. If you have two to five, it's moderate. If you have six or above, it's severe. And this is just looking at the diagnosis now of marijuana use disorder. The other epidemiologic study I showed you was uh, initiating marijuana and using marijuana. Um, this is actually diagnosing a marijuana use disorder in the past year amongst people that are age 12 or older. And you can see that um, the biggest uptick has occurred in the 18 to 25. That's the highest rate um, of uh, marijuana use disorder diagnoses, and there's a significant uptick over the last couple of years. When you look at the adolescent population, it's really kind of stayed flat or even tailed off a little bit. And then uh, the 26 or older, there's been a slight uptick. So you know, just 
hearkening back to Dr. Jensen, we need more studies to understand this better, but there are clear signals that uh, we have to be concerned about. This is data from, the, from Independence Blue Cross. We're in network with Independence Blue Cross and all the blues of America, actually. And this is data that uh, um, Blue Cross has shared with us, Independence Blue Cross has shared with us. And they've seen a 180% overall increase between 2012 and 2018 in marijuana use disorder treatment, 100% increase in patients 19 to 25. So that, again, that young adult population seems the most vulnerable. Adolescence has gone up, but not quite at the rate of young adults, 25% increase there. And this is a study uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, that show a threefold increase in ER visits in Colorado. I talked to you about why edibles, um, cardiovascular symptoms can occur as well. What happens when you smoke marijuana is that heart rate can go up anywhere from 20 to 100%. Um, and in some people, that could end up causing significant uh, symptoms, and if someone has any blockages in their coronary arteries, it'll be a failed stress test. And then psychosis, which I'll talk about the vulnerabilities in a second. So the health effects of marijuana, I know that Dr. Marsh and Dr. Jensen went through this, so I won't go uh, through this in depth, but it's important to understand that uh, there are cannabis-induced medical and psychiatric issues. So delirium is a medical emergency. It's rare, but can happen. Um, Cannabis-induced psychotic disorder we see every week. And uh, thankfully, it's typically uh, self-limiting over time, uh, three to five days, and goes away. Cannabis-induced anxiety disorder is when you use on a more regular basis. Again, maybe in the beginning it helps and is anxiolytic, but as you use more and more, it becomes anxiogenic. And then sleep disorders are ubiquitous with cannabis. So marijuana use is harmful to developing brains and youth. Uh, use uh, increases the risk of negative outcomes. And this is just looking at recent studies that uh, discourage changes in gray, it, it, uh, discovered rather, changes in gray matter volume in young marijuana users. So that's of great concern, but that has to be followed up. That's one study and we need more. Adolescent marijuana use is associated with an increased risk for depression and suicidality. I'll talk more about that, but that's of great concern. And then chronic marijuana use is associated with cognitive impairment and worsened academic performance. The CARDIA study that I know uh, was talked about by Dr. Marsh, I believe, and that had 3,385 patients, 11% uh, had long-term use of marijuana, and in that 11%, they had a decrease in verbal memory. And uh, I'm gonna show you another study uh, in a second about IQ points dropping as well. So daily users of marijuana are three times more likely to have a, uh, to develop a psychotic disorder, and high potency marijuana daily use is a there's a four times greater uh, odds of developing psychosis. And actually, 13% of all schizophrenia would not uh, exist if it weren't for marijuana. I know Dr. Marsh mentioned mentioned that in his talk. And this is the gene. I, I think it's very important to see that there are certain vulnerabilities out there, and we can assume that some of the young people that we see on a regular basis have this AKT1CC gene um, that increases the risk of psychosis if they use marijuana on an everyday basis. And then um, the NISARC study that was done in 2005 showed that all mental health issues get worse with marijuana. Uh, I know Dr. Jensen said, is it associated or causative? And the truth is we could debate that all day, but there's, uh, the data is very clear, especially in major depression in adolescence. You can see that major depression is on the upswing with the use of marijuana, and then major depression with severe impairment is also on the upswing with the use of uh, marijuana. And this is just looking at a Venn diagram, and you can see the intersection in green is where I want to focus on. That's uh, used to have a substance use disorder and a major depressive episode. Uh, that's what MDE stands for. And um, I, with the, Dr. Jensen talked about treating the mental health issue first and then the uh, marijuana use disorder. We feel differently about that. 
We feel as though treatment has to be concurrent, and we have uh, 11 full-time psychologists. We have three psychiatrists full-time here. Because of that, we believe firmly that both uh, substance use disorder and the, the psychiatric malady need to be treated concomitantly on parallel tracks, because if you treat one and not the other, then you're going to have relapse of either one. And this is just looking at uh, another study. Uh, this is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, another uh, look at the epidemiologic study that happened in 2018. And 25% of teens with major depressive episode used marijuana. So are they using it to help their uh, depression or is it causing their depression? It's hard to tell. And this is just looking at an older age group. Again, those with serious mental illness seem to use marijuana, maybe trying to relieve their symptoms, or maybe the marijuana is causing their symptoms. So again, Dr. Jensen's right. We have that great debate about associated versus causative. And uh, this is just looking at marijuana and suicide. And this is uh, you know, very significant data. In 2019, a Colorado toxicology report showed an increase in the percentage of adolescents, 10 to 19, uh, who were suicide victims that tested positive for marijuana. So these were uh, successful completed suicides that had toxicology testing. And what you saw that there was um, a 20.7 uh, percent uh, positivity in, in, 20, in 2011 and 2013. That went up to 22.4 percent. Um, in uh, 2014 to 2016. And at the same time, uh, alcohol went down. So the use of alcohol in these completed suicides went down, whereas marijuana went up. So these are some of the health issues. I mentioned a lot of this uh, already, distorted perception, psychosis, and, and angiogenesis or anxiogenesis, depression. Um, impaired coordination, impaired cognitive and executive functioning, learning difficulties, impairment of memory and lassitude, which is of great debate. And uh, the study that we always quote is a New Zealand study that showed that uh, heavy use, which is heavy marijuana use every day over time, dropped IQ eight points. And uh, what we know is that heavy use of marijuana decreases connectivity of brain cells, so that is not in question. We have the science that is very good and supports that. Long-term permanent cognitive changes and memory impairment when used heavily in the developing brain can occur. I mentioned the cardia study uh, that uh, Dr. Marsh mentioned, and then the heart rate I mentioned already can increase, and that can lead to uh, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks. And the risk is actually five times greater within the first hour of use because of that increased heart rate. Again, failing a stress test. Drug driving, this uh, I think all of us would agree, Dr. Uh, Jensen, Dr. Marsh, and myself, that marijuana is uh, the most prevalent illegal drug detected in impaired drivers, um, fatally injured drivers, and motor vehicle crash victims. And that's from the, the National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration. And then uh, we also, there's another study I wanna just hearken to and, and point out, that driving under the influence of marijuana is associated with a 92% increased risk of vehicular crashes. So that's very significant. And it's for all the reasons I mentioned, that depth perception, the slowing down of time, uh, the lack of coordination and reactivity time slowing as well. And then such driving is associated with 110% increase in fatal crashes. And we don't know how to measure what is the safe amount of marijuana in the system. Because marijuana is much more complicated than alcohol and how it is metabolized. Um, and this is a, a hot off the presses study uh, that came out uh, in JAMA Internal Medicine. I'm an internist and psychiatrist, so I uh, read both, uh, both journals. And uh, in June of this year, a, a study came out that really helped us understand that there is an increase in uh, fatality rates in, uh, in four states that legalized recreational marijuana versus the control states that did not legalize recreational marijuana. So this study is uh, just, again, hot off the press presses. We need to debate it further, but what it's saying is that marijuana 
is a risk factor for fatal uh, motor vehicle accidents. So what are some of the barriers to treatment? I, I won't read all of this to you, but you know, a lot of it is that uh, you know, marijuana isn't uh, dangerous and why go to treatment uh, if, if it's not dangerous and miss going to school or fall behind in school. Um, some other issues are that, uh, that marijuana use will decrease educational milestones or slow them down. It increases co-occurring disorders, attentional issue, issues occur, there's a post-acute withdrawal, there's also a withdrawal, acute withdrawal associated with it. There's a lot of peer and social pressures. Um, students in recovery struggle with college admission. We have a college success program where we run sober dorms and uh, support uh, the recovery of young people uh, and get them in, back into a local college and support their recovery. Uh, and what we found is that their GPAs in recovery go up astronomically. Our average GPA is well over 3.0 in our students that are uh, matriculated in local uh, universities uh, in our sober dorms. And in mental health first, uh, uh, receipt of mental health services and specialty substance use disorder treatment in the past year among youth aged 12 to 17. So this is the adolescent population who had a past year major depressive episode and a substance use disorder. And you can see that um, that there is an uptick as a result of uh, marijuana use. And teens are more likely to try other substances. Uh, marijuana has increased to be a primary drug of choice uh, for 30% of our Karen adolescent patients, and that's up from uh, 25% in 2015. So there's been a 5% increase. Um, about 80 to 85 percent of our teens have marijuana as a drug of choice. It may not be the drug of choice that brought them in, but it is a drug of choice um, at, at the rate of about 80 to 85 percent of our adolescent population. So that's significant. So treatment, I won't. Um, Treatment has to be individualized, uh, and it should be individual and group counseling. Uh, the ASAM placement criteria will help you uh, figure out what level of care the, uh, pa the student or patient should go into, and it uh, depends on uh, whether they uh, are early in the process or later in the process, whether they have comorbidities or don't have comorbidities. So it, they could start at intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, they can go to residential treatment, which is what we do here at uh, Karen, Pennsylvania. Uh, case and care management needs to happen. There is no medication uh, assisted therapy for um, marijuana use disorder. Uh, we follow all of our patients for one year and support them in their recovery because at one year, uh, recovery is more likely than relapse. And at five years of, of abstinence, uh, the rate of uh, relapse is exactly the same as the rate of addiction in the entire population. We believe in 12-step fellowships and peer supports. Um, here you can see the uh, myriad of uh, services that we provide here at Karen and should be provided uh, to anyone getting comprehensive uh, substance use disorder treatment. I circled uh, pharmacotherapy because there is none at this moment, but there are studies out there and we're hopeful that we will have a medication-assisted uh, therapy for marijuana use disorder in the near future. And uh, just, I want to say that just because something's legal does not mean it's safe. And again, this is a, a state thing, not a federal thing. Uh, and the federal government has refused to change the scheduling of marijuana. It's still Schedule One, which means it has no medicinal purposes. Um, but the states have gone about and legalized medical marijuana, and in many states, uh, legalized recreational marijuana as well. So um, I'm right at the time that I've been asked to stop, so I want to uh, open up now to questions. Okay. I'm muted. There we go. Okay. Thank you Here so much, go. Dr. Garbley. That was fantastic yeah. and great timing. I'm really impressed. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, and I'm, of course, going to have sure. a couple myself if we have time. Um, 
Uh, could you address uh, any concerns you might have regarding the lack of medical training that bud tenders possess uh, at the dispensaries and the medical advice that they're providing individuals? Okay. So the Pennsylvania Department of Health, I, I could speak about our state, they require that there has to be a pharmacist, physician, or advanced practice nurse somewhere available to the dispensary. But what happens when someone actually goes to a dispensary, because we talk to folks that do that, is that um, those, those more knowledgeable folks do not interact with the, the patient that has the card. What happens is that there is a bud tender, as you mentioned, who really is, um, quote unquote, the expert. They do consult with somebody uh, that has a higher level of education. But again, we don't have FDA approval. We don't have the studies to show what is the efficacy, what is the milligrams we should give, what is the frequency we should give it, and what are the side effects of this particular uh, strain of marijuana. So it is kind of the wild, wild west out there. And hopefully as studies, more and more studies happen, we will understand this better and know how to prescribe it and know exactly what to give or not to give to patients. Great, thank you. Uh, what percentage of people have the AK1CC gene making them more vulnerable to psychosis if they use marijuana? So that percentage is about 25 percent, um, 25 to 30 percent. So um, again, we're a residential treatment center. So I want to just uh, say that because we're a residential treatment center and uh, marijuana can affect a vulnerable population with that gene and they can have psychosis, they end up with us. So we select out the sicker, if you will, of uh, uh, comorbidity and they come to us because they know that we can handle them at a residential level because we have the psychologists and psychiatrists to deal with this. And it is, it, it's, I would never call it routine. All treatment is uh, complex and should be individualized, but it is something that we see on a, on a weekly basis at least. Thank you. Um, what would you say to high school students who insist that marijuana is helping their anxiety better than other treatments that they have tried? Well, what I would say is that uh, th there is a law of diminishing returns. What we know about marijuana is that if you use it infrequently, it may very well be anxiolytic. But if you start to use it more often, which is almost always the case, so more is better, right, in our society. So if you use it more and more often, what happens is you go from uh, anxiolytic to anxiogenic. So it begins to cause anxiety to worsen, whereupon in the beginning it might have helped a little bit. So really, and I agree with Dr. Jensen, that we, we really need uh, psychoeducation out there. Uh, we have a student assistance program. We're in a thousand schools up and down the East Coast. We have well over a hundred thousand encounters every single year, and it's all about education. It's really trying to catch things upstream and then intervening before someone has a fully codified substance use disorder, and really educating them about some of the vicissitudes of of using marijuana more and more often. Yeah. Do you find a link in your work between past trauma and marijuana use? Yes. So um, PTSD is being studied um, uh, right as we speak in the VA uh, and mar marijuana um, in CBD with certain percentages of Delta 9 THC in them are being utilized to see what is the best mixture for the treatment of PTSD. So those studies are not done, so I can't tell you the results of that, but I'm glad that they're happening. And it, they need to happen because um, uh, there might be a value uh, to certain parts of the plant, maybe not the psychoactive part, THC, but maybe uh, cannabinoids or cannabidiols. They may be very helpful in treating PTSD. We don't know that yet. 
So we're in the nascent stages of this. This is a new substance. It happens to be botanical, and as a result, it's harder to get our wrap our hands around it. But there's many botanicals that ended up being uh, synthesized, like digoxin. It comes from the foxglove plant. Um, there's taxol, which is a chemotherapeutic agent that comes from the yew bark uh, of the yew tree. And uh, so these are botanicals as well that we've been able to synthesize. And I think we're just too early in the game quite yet to get to that point where we actually do go through the FDA, not bypass it, find out what marijuana can help, what it can, what are the side effects, what is the milligrams, how, what is the frequency at which we should give it for whatever the malady may be. We're just too early right now. Great, great, thank you. Um, we are seeing parents come in and asking if they obtain if they can obtain a medical card for their teen. I'd like to have some legal information in addition to educating them on the brain. What is the legal age for obtaining a medical marijuana card and can parents sign for a card for their adolescent? Well, I think it would have to, you have to look state to state. This is all about state rules, but uh, near as I can tell, it's 18 and above. And uh, we, we here in Pennsylvania have lobbied our Lieutenant Governor, our Governor, Senator Toomey, uh, Senator Casey. They've all, uh, I've spent a lot of time with all of them trying to set the age at 25. And the reason is that we know that it takes until about then for the brain to be fully developed. So that's what we have lobbied for. Um, we have not been successful though, I have to tell you. So we'll see what happens, but um, I really do think that uh, 25 should be the age, if, if, if it has to happen at all, 25 should be the age and above, because it makes scientific sense to do it that way. Thank you. Yep. Are insurance companies accepting the cannabis use disorder diagnosis and covering the cost of treatment for adolescents? Yes. I showed you statistics from Independence Blue Cross, so yes, absolutely, because they're, they're understanding the uptick that's occurring and the comorbidities and the fact that uh, if you do not treat this, if you do not treat the uh, cannabis use disorder, then they will be paying a lot more money for mental health uh, admissions and mental health treatment, and uh, so they very much want to get ahead of this. And they believe, like we believe, that the substance use disorder and the uh, mental health comorbidity and the medical comorbidity should be treated at the same time. Not in, not in series, but in parallel. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Do you believe pediatricians should ask patients if they use marijuana, and if so, at what age should this begin? So this should begin at the uh, 12 years old, uh, from the very beginning. You see the data from the National uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health. It's 12 and older, right? So that, that, although at 12 it's not as frequent, that's when you want to ask the question because that's an opportunity for, for education. And at, at 12 years old, you can then educate that young person about what marijuana can do to their developing brain. And that they, if they start using at a very early age, like 12, then they have a higher incidence of going on to have a fully codified cannabis use disorder, independent of genetics, um, independent of environment, simply by using at an early age because their brain is not fully developed. Can you speak to the role disinformation from social media and other sources plays in being an obstacle to prevention and treatment? Yes, yeah, so there's, uh, there's quite a lobby. Uh, this is a multi-billion dollar business, okay, and the lobby is significant. And uh, there is a, a, this feeling that there'll be a windfall with taxes uh, for the states and things of that sort. Um, and as a result, uh, they see the dollar signs and not necessarily see the um, the issues associated with uh, with the cannabis use disorder, co comorbid mental health, and medical issues. And um, and it's it's been a challenge for us. I can tell you when we talk to our legislators, 
because they have this idea that uh, if we tax this and legalize it and tax it, this will help us um, in areas that we need the help. And um, that may be true. I'm, I'm, not, a, uh, I'm not a CPA, uh, I'm not an MBA, I'm a physician. Um, but I think that that is, uh, it's putting the cart before the horse. We really have to be mindful of what this can do to a young developing brain. And that should, that should inform our decisions, not the money. Right, absolutely. And I could just say personally, because I work with so many family members, um, you know, time, not much time goes by between calls from parents who are in crisis because they've got a 16, 17 year old who has completely, you know, disengaged from life. And, um, you know, that's what, what really weighs on my heart when I hear everybody talking about the, the fiscal potential for this. You know, can we please look at the, the public health matters that, that will tax us in other ways? I mean, tax, but, you know, uh, challenges. Right. Ways, so. Uh, here's another question. How do we navigate the dangers of marijuana when so many states are making it legal for recreational use? Well, I think that, you know, again, the card is before the horse and uh, what we need is studies. I mean, the one thing that the uh, DEA did, which I think is very important, is they said we will not reschedule this. It's still a Schedule One, has no medicinal value. However, we will open up uh, the country to studies. So you can now, if you're associated with a medical school, you can do marijuana studies. We have one that we're going to be starting soon with a medical school, a local Philadelphia medical school. Um, so th that is an important uh, distinction to make. They, they said, look, if you can prove that there is a truly a medicinal quality to this plant, then we will reschedule it. But right now the evidence is not strong. So go and find the evidence. And, that, and I think we, what we need in, in medicine always is more rigorous science, good studies, peer-reviewed journals, things of that sort. And I think we're well on the way for that to happen, for a treatment center like Karen to have the appetite to study marijuana, to see its effects um, on uh, a, a, someone who has a known substance use disorder and neuropathic um, chronic pain, um, that tells you that uh, all of us are all in to try to figure this out. Can you talk about um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome and do you see much of that at, at Karen? We do. We see, uh, so we see that I would say a couple times a month we have that. Um, and, and we've actually had to transfer young people uh, to Reading Hospital, we're all on staff there, to give them IV fluids um, because they're unable to take anything uh, in. So that's a real entity. It's not, it's not uh, you know, ubiquitous by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's not rare either. So it's somewhere in between. And the higher the potency, the greater the likelihood that that hyperemesis will occur. Can you please explain that for any panelists or any participants who might not understand what that syndrome is? So uh, that syndrome is all about the CB1 receptor in that central chemo trigger zone, okay? So when you use uh, marijuana, the active ingredient, uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, binds to that CB1 receptor in that uh, central chemo trigger zone, which is all about um, nausea and vomiting. So what happens is that if you use marijuana that's potent and use it on a regular basis, that uh, that particular area of the brain uh, is uh, activated. And when it gets activated, it causes um, increased nausea and in hyperemesis is simply increased vomiting. That's the layman's way of saying that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yesterday, Dr. Marsh mentioned that um, Pennsylvania is the first state in the country to actually collaborate with the, the medical marijuana dispensaries on to do some research. Are, can, you, can you talk about that at all? Do you know anything about that's being I done? do. I, I happen to know Dr. Levine, uh, who is the Secretary of the Department of Health. And actually, she, she and I had a conversation before she added opioid use disorder to the list. And she called me because she wanted uh, my opinion and also to let me know, give me sort of a warning that that's going to happen. And the reason that she did it is because if you put 
uh, a disorder, a malady on the list, then you can study it. If it's not on the list, you can't study it. So again, cart before the horse, right? So, you know, you'll see on the list in Pennsylvania that marijuana treats opioid use disorder. It's one of the things you can prescribe, or you can give someone a card for it, right? Um, but, w but what it's done is it's opened up the door so that we can actually study it and see does it have merit or not. And that is happening at uh, major universities in Pennsylvania. We're actually studying to see whether uh, marijuana is a medication-assisted uh, treatment strategy. It doesn't look like it is, but right now, uh, you know, we're, we're, the data is still out there. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, someone asked about uh, her, their son has experienced a dissociation from using marijuana. Is that something, you know, sort of an out-of-body experience? So is that something that you see frequently with this use? Yes. It's a, disso it's a dissociative substance. So it will disconnect someone from their feelings and from uh, what's happening right in front of them during uh, intoxication. So it is, that's a ubiquitous um, side effect or effect, I should say, of the psychoactive part of the plant, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Okay. Since we're on that subject, um, I know that we have a number of educators on this program. Can you talk about some of the other kind of more, more apparent warning signs or indications that there might be some THC use? So I think that if you start, if you have a good student that's suddenly handing in their assignments late or is uh, struggling, you know, to do well when they were doing well and you see um, redness in the eyes, that injection of the conjunctiva, that's a sure sign. All the visine in the world, if you're using on a regular basis, will not get that to go away. So that's, a, you know, you have to look for those signs. And if you see that they've withdrawn, if they're pulling away from their friend group and they're, or they found different friends, okay, um, that uh, you know to be associated with marijuana. These are all red flags that need to be addressed. That's where our student assistant professionals, that's where they come in at these 1,000 schools that we're in. They get called in because a teacher um, or, you know, a guidance counselor sees these signs and says, hey, I need you to talk to, you know, uh, Johnny about uh, whether they're using marijuana or not. And our professionals know how to do that. And they teach uh, education professionals how to do that as well. Right. You know, we hear the argument a lot that it's not as addictive as, it's not as bad as, and I think that's a challenge that I'm just reading some of the questions from yesterday as well. It, I, I think any help that you can give, um, a lot of the folks that are with us today um, are also parents, you know, so they're, they're working in, in the field that they're interested in, in learning more about this, but uh, for parents, how can we have conversations? Um, I certainly wish I had known this, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, how can we have conversations with our children? Um, and actually, let me back up and just say, when I've talked, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can talk to my son 10 years into his recovery, he's 31 now, he's all grown up. So I can ask him, you know, what would have been an effective conversation for us? And his feeling was that if I made it clear that we are absolutely not, um, we would not permit this kind of substance use, that he would just have gotten much better at hiding it. And he was already pretty good at hiding it. Um, so how, how, how do you feel that we can handle some of these conversations that keep those doors open um, with young people? Well, I think it's, it's really about building a therapeutic alliance, uh, whether it be an education professional, whether it be a parent with their child. It's really just, you know, uh, treading softly, you know, establishing, you know, a common ground, a place that's safe, you can start to have these conversations. And then start the educational process. Did you know this or did you know that? And if necessary, get that, get your son or your daughter to a professional who understands this well. Addiction medicine is a fully codified subspecialty of medicine now. We have our own sponsoring board, our own board certification. We graduated 100 fellows in this country last year that are practicing addiction medicine. So 
I'm actually in charge of physician education for the country, for the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and we're changing how we educate young minds in medical school, in residency, and also in fellowship. So we're learning how to have these conversations. So motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy. These are all techniques that we learn, cognitive behavioral therapy, all of these I don't want to say tricks, but uh, languages, if you will, that help us build that alliance and begin the process of educating that young person that marijuana may not be the answer, that it may end up causing problems in the future. Right. Uh, yesterday, we had a little bit of a discussion about the term gateway drug, and I was wondering yeah. if you could weigh in on that. So I know that uh, Dr. Jensen, uh, his stance was that nicotine is a gateway drug and that marijuana is not. But I, I, I just want to go back to that one slide where we have seen a decrease, a steady decrease in cigarette use, uh, whereas we've seen a steady increase in marijuana use. And um, in 2015, the, they intersected and marijuana went above uh, cigarette use and they've been going in different directions ever since, so the last five years. And um, so it's a great debate, this whole gateway drug issue. Um, what I would say is it's, it's its own substance use disorder, independent of any other drug. It doesn't have to lead to another drug. It's impairing in its own right. And it may be that they use something else to maybe nullify some of the side effects of the marijuana, or they, it, they just go to their dealer and their dealer opens a different part of their jacket and they give them something else to try and say, see if you like this. So, um, you know, I, I, you know it's, not, it's a debate that, will, that no one's gonna win, right? No one's gonna win this debate, but, I, but science is telling us that we're going in the wrong direction with marijuana and in the right direction with cigarette use. Right, right, right. And can you talk a little bit about um, the kinds of, I know that at Karen you have an adolescent program, you have a young adult program, and then you have many others. Um, when you see patients who are admitted to Karen as adolescents with, with primary cannabis use disorder, um, can you talk about the outcomes? Because what I hear from treatment professionals over and over is I would rather have be treating 10 opioid patients than one cannabis use disorder patient because the opioid patient knows their life is unmanageable. This has got to stop. This is not going well, you know, but the, the, it it's a, seems to be a much greater challenge. And I'm wondering if there's a difference that you're seeing for the over 18 or over 21 population. Well, what I would say is that our success rates are transcendent in the industry. So um, we follow all of our patients for at least a year, and our success rate is 80% at that one-year mark. And we do toxicology testing, you know, random toxicology testing, so it's not just self-report. Um, and also uh, the data from uh, our insurers is right around that same number, and that includes teams. So we, when, when they get to our level, residential, there's reasons why they come to this highest level of care. I would say the bigger challenge would be in the lower levels of care, with intensive outpatient or even partial hospitalization because they um, may not be so far along the path. When we see them, they have started to really suffer uh, the vicissitudes of their marijuana use, whether it be, be they no longer are welcome back to their college or they've been asked to leave their high school or they're experiencing mental health comorbidities or even medical comorbidities or psychosis or things of that sort, hyperemesis. And that's, why, that's where we get to see these folks. And when they get to us and have all of these other issues, their, their readiness for change is much greater than someone who may just show up three days a week in an IOP. So it gets, I, I see that to be a bigger challenge. But again, I think there's opportunities there to move the ball up the field and try to get someone to a place where they will start to use less and less and then make a decision, I don't need this in my life. And that, that, that's what we're, our uh, goal is always going to be meet them where they're at and then walk with them from there. Great. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to encourage everybody. We have we do have about five minutes left. So if anybody has any final questions for Dr. Garbley, please submit them now in the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, and I guess I'm also wondering too about the because we're really focused on adolescents in this program. Um, you know what you've been seeing as a just this may not necessarily relate specifically to to cannabis or marijuana, but um, with COVID-19, with increased stress and anxiety um, being reported pretty universally, are you seeing changes? Yes, working? we're seeing self-medication. So, you know, that pathological pursuit for reward or relief, and that's why I stress that. So we're seeing more and more people using substances, cannabis included, for relief of their anxiety, their fears of the future. This is a very uncertain time. The one thing recovery does for anyone who enters into recovery, it lets them deal with uncertainty. You know, that's the blessing of recovery. And we stress that because right now, I can't tell you when COVID-19 will end. I, I know that it'll take a vaccine, but I don't know when that vaccine will come. So uh, that uncertainty and, and uh, what's going to happen with the economy, what's going to happen with school, will I go back to in-person school or will it be virtual school, will mom and dad have to teach me or will I get taught by teachers, all of that, are, these are valid concerns. And I think we're all going through it in some way, shape or form. And uh, we teach them a, a skill set where they can deal with uncertainty and find a way to not have to medicate their feelings away, to, to live with their feelings, to honor their feelings, and then move on from them. And that's, uh, you know, these are techniques I mentioned, motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. These are all tools that they, everybody leaves with in their toolbox. Everyone that leaves Karen leaves with those tools. Great, thank you. A uh, question just came in. Uh, can you speak to harm reduction in an adolescent who is not willing to attend treatment or to do abstinence? Yes, Dr. Jensen brought this up and I agree. And then that's what I was telling you before, meet them where they're at and ask if they're willing to cut down. So will you, instead of smoking every day, could you smoke you know, less than that? And then keep seeing that particular young person and keep moving the ball up the field to the point where you get them to say, you know what, I don't need this anymore. I'm down to, you know, one, just on the weekends. And the truth is, I'm, it's, it's not doing for me what it used to do for me, and I'm ready to quit. And, and so that readiness for change, you, you prepare them for that. Great. Thank you for that. So um, I want to remind everyone, and I did think, first of all, Thank you so much, Dr. Garbley. This was phenomenal. And you you made this hour and a half just absolutely fly. And I really appreciate your knowledge and your time and obviously taking the time to review the, the previous speakers as well. So thank you for that. I do want to tell um, folks that I, I checked it out on my phone. The survey comes up when you end. This time it will work. I apologize for the confusion yesterday. I just resent all of you um, the link to the follow-up page so that you have that in the chat box. Um, but that is for um, the survey that comes up on this is our personal survey. Please go to that follow-up page for the evaluation that you need to complete, as well as seeing um, if you want to share yesterday's and today's presentations, the recordings will be there. Uh, Dr. Garbley, do we have your permission to provide um, a PDF of your slideshow? Absolutely, sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, great. Oh, and I have a message here. Um, from uh, Adam Lush from Karen Treatment Center. Hi, Adam. Uh, our View from the Mountain webinar next week, hosted by Christine Storm and Kate Appleman, will focus on teen cannabis use and prevention. It will be next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Thank you, Adam, for that. Um, and thank you again so much, Dr. Garbley. And thank you to everyone who was here. Wow, what, we had um, close to 100 people on both calls. So really grateful to all of you for the time that you've taken to be with us. Some very important topic with obviously a lot more to learn and um, we will be back to talk further in the future. So um, we look forward to seeing you then. So thank you again. Thank you for Dr. having Garbley. me. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye now.